Okay. Uh, welcome to this Autometrics webinar about BPPV assessment and how to improve outcomes with proper methods. Uh, my name is Anders Lund. I'm the project manager here at Autometrics and I'll be the moderator of today's session. Before we start the presentation, here's a little information about how we will run this webinar. In order to reduce background noise, we have muted all participants. You can ask questions anytime during the session using the question box in your webinar menu bar. All questions will be collected during the session and uh, will be answered at the end of the session. In case we don't have time to answer all questions, you will receive an email reply after the webinar. If you experience technical problems or need immediate support, please write a message directly to the moderator, who is listed as Anders Lund, in your menu bar. Um, yeah. Today we have uh, an exciting lineup here. We have um, Cameron Berin, uh, PhD, who is an assistant professor emeritus at uh, Ohio State University. And we have Wendy Cromley Welsh, who is a product manager for the Balance products here at Autometrics, to present uh, today. And yeah, Cameron, go ahead, take it from here. Thank you, Andres. Uh, today's topic is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. It is one of the most uh, common causes of dizziness and balance problems. And, but fortunately, with proper assessment, there's a condition that can be easily uh, treated. And in fact, it's one of the only uh, vestibular and balance uh, problems that can be fixed with this kind of easy uh, method. The key to proper treatment is a proper assessment. So that's the topic today. Uh, we have another webinar in about a month and a half or so where we concentrate on the <clears throat> treatment issues. The key to the uh, assessment is first complete case history, which is always important in busy patients. And then after the uh, case history, we need to select the proper maneuvers to diagnose the patient. And while we're doing the maneuvers, it is uh, extremely important to move the head in the plane of the affected canals. Otherwise, we may get responses from other canals and confuse our diagnosis. And finally, monitoring eye movements will help in identifying which canals are involved. I am going to cover the first two cases, the, the first two uh, key parts of the assessment, and my colleague Wendy Crumley will be uh, covering some of the other issues that how the equipment that uh, we have can help you with the uh, identifying the plane of the canals and with monitoring the eye movements. PPPV is characterized by a transient episode of vertigo, which usually does not last more than a few seconds. And the vertigo is usually can be quite severe to the point that the patient might get sick during the, the maneuver. But generally, there are no other auditory or uh, neurologic symptoms associated with this. If there's anything else, it's usually incidental. It's something unrelated to BPP. As I said, this is one of the most uh, common abnormalities we have in uh, uh, not only as far as the balance and dizziness problems, but as a common problem in general. About uh, 20 to 25 percent of the office visits uh, to dizziness clinics involve BPPV. And in some of the population studies, it's been reported that this condition can be present in about 40 percent of the patients with balance problems. Not all of them seek medical help. That's why the uh, um, visits to the clinics might be fewer than the, what is present in the general population. It is much more common in the older individuals. The first incident of BPPV usually occurs at the age of about 50. Um, and then from that point on, the uh, prevalence goes up uh, exponentially to the level that at the age of 80 and above, at approximately 50% of the population might suffer from BPPV. 
the condition also has a very high recurrence rate, which means uh, in one year, approximately, patients will be diagnosed and treated with DPTV. 30% of them, uh, on the average, will come back for uh, another episode of DPTV. The cause uh, in approximately 50 to 70% of the cases are unknown. Uh, uh, but among the known causes, head trauma is the number one, and it's quite common secondary to an inner ear disease. So if the patient has had a vestibular neuritis or meniere's, uh, you should expect quite a few of these patients will come back with an episode of BPPD in the future. The mechanism of BPPD is uh, <clears throat> we know that the semicircular canals are generally not uh, responsive to the uh, gravity because the endolymph and the cupula, they have the same specific densities. So when the orientation of the canal changes with respect to gravity, uh, you do not get any change in the uh, position of the cupula and you don't get uh, uh, any excitation or inhibition of the canal. But if you have particles that are heavier than the endolymph or the cupula, if these particles end up in the canal, then it makes the canal sensitive to gravity, and that's the main source of BPPV. Initially, most BPPVs were thought to be of the cupulothiasis type. These are the particles that most likely are otoconia that separate from the, either the utricle, which is the more common site, or the sacu, and because of the anatomy of the <clears throat> semicircular canals, oftentimes they end up in the posterior canal. If the particles attach themselves to the cupula, that's the white area here, that will be cupulothiasis. That's initially what uh, BPP was thought of, most of them to be uh, cupulothiasis. But in fact, it turns out that 90%, over 90% of the cases are the particles are not attached to the, to the cupula, but they are floating in the semicircular canals, and that condition is called canalothiasis, the condition where the particles are attached to the cupula are the cupulothiasis. These are the most common types of BPPD. This explanation of the particles uh, uh, attaching themselves or floating in the canals explains why we have higher incidence with aging and higher incidence with the uh, inner ear diseases, because whatever causes deterioration of the macula then uh, it will result in the, uh, in the particles separating and causing BPPV. It's also high recurrence rate as explained by this theory because whatever initially caused the detachment of the particles from the utricle, it's likely that it will have loosened up the glue that holds the particles and it would cause more incidents later on. Initially, BPPV was thought to be primarily of posterior canal origin, but now we know that although that's the majority of the cases, 90 to 95 percent of the cases, horizontal canals or lateral canals can be involved. And to some extent, but much rare, uh, is anterior canal can be involved in the uh, causing BPPV. 95 percent of the cases of BPPV are unilateral, confined to one ear. Uh, but about 5% of the cases can involve both right and left uh, uh, inner ears, and mo most of the cases of bilateral uh, diseases are uh, as a result of head trauma. When we try to assess BPPV, as I said, the most important thing is the case history. Usually the patients uh, with BPPV describe brief but very intense episodes of true vertigo following head movements. These episodes are usually much stronger during the initial um, head movement. So for example, the patient will describe getting uh, intense vertigo when they wake up in the morning, they roll in bed. But as the day goes on and they make many more head movements throughout that, the, the intensity or even the presence of BPPV <coughs> might become uh, less noticeable to the patient. Of course, the next morning when they are in bed and they keep their head from moving for an extended period of time, they will then again experience BPPV after that. Many of these patients also describe um, in between head movements, while they're not really symptomatic, they describe imbalance. 
The imbalance most likely is caused by the particles separating from the utricle, and those particles, there's no, they leave a hole in the utricle. So most of these patients probably ex uh, describing orlytic syndromes. We don't really have a good way of testing those, but perhaps uh, VAMPs, OVAMPs in particular, because it most likely examines the utricle, will be a way to look at these patients' uh, uh, utricular and sacular function if you're using CVAMPs. Generally, patients do not have any other otologic and neurologic symptoms, as I mentioned before. These uh, conditions, if they're present, they're usually due to something else, not BPPV. Risk factors for BPPV, history of head trauma, history of previous inner ear diseases like vestibular neuritis or Meniere's. Again, the timetable for this varies, but if you get somebody with vestibular neuritis, within six months or so, you might get uh, patients with uh, episodes of BPPV from the ear that had vestibular neuritis. Age, obviously, is a big risk factor. Uh, patients above the age of 50 are highly susceptible to BPPV, and if they had any previous bouts of BPPV, they're also more susceptible to the condition. The recommended procedure in 2008, American Academy of Laryngology came up with a series of recommendations for patients with BPPV. I will read these recommendations to you, and I think they're actually, they've uh, got this quite correctly. They um, re strongly recommend that the patients to be diagnosed with posterior canal BPPV when the patient exhibits vertigo and nystagmus as a result of Dix-Halpike maneuver. This is a strong recommendation. On the other hand, they recommend against doing imaging studies, complete vestibular testing, meaning VNG, ENG, rotation tests, and other things like that in these patients with BPPV, unless they exhibit symptoms that seem to be unrelated to BPPV and they have other symptoms and signs. Uh, so in most cases, all you do is a dixal pike, and if it's positive, then you diagnose the patient's BPPV. They also recommend against uh, routine um, prescription of vestibular suppressant to these patients. Uh, they recommend performing a role maneuver if the patient seems to have a history of BPPV, but Dixal Park seems to be negative, then the patients are um, recommended to receive roll maneuver or log roll maneuver for the diagnosis of horizontal or lateral canal BPPV. Uh, the um, uh, panel for uh, AAO recommended uh, the BPPV to be differentiated from other causes there are many central nervous, skin, central nervous system disorders that mimic BPPV, so it's uh, important that the patients undergo differential diagnosis for them. Uh, the panel did not make any recommendation for or against audio audiometric testing, so it is up to you if you want to do audiometric testing in these patients. So here are two videos that show uh, the most common uh, methods, the first uh, method would be the dix halpike maneuver, which is for the uh, diagnosis of posterior and anterior canal, BPPV. With the patient sitting down, you turn the head 45 degrees to the right or to the left and bring the patient down to the uh, supine position with the head hanging slightly over the edge. Uh, a couple of points here. One is that it's important that you make the head turn close to 45 degrees as possible. That will limit the involvement from other semicircular canals and limit the stimulation to the one posterior canal and one anterior canal. Of course, the patient's safety and the patient's uh, uh, comfort is important here, so if the patient has difficulty turning the head, uh, don't attempt turning it more than what the patient is comfortable. The second point is that you do not have to move the patient very quickly because this is the particles are moved by the uh, gravity, not by how fast you move the patient. And uh, finally, you do not have to hang the patient's head too far over the edge. As far as the, uh, the maneuver goes, uh, what you see here in this video is quite accurate. 
There's an alternative method, sideline maneuver, where the patient sits on the edge of the table. The head is turned 45 degrees away from the test ear. This is the opposite of the Dixal bike, where you turn the head toward the test ear. In this case, you turn the head away from the test ear and then lay the patient down on the shoulder uh, uh, opposite to the, uh, to the direction of head turn. So one more time, you see the video here and the patient is laid down. Now, if you look at the trajectory of the head in the sideline maneuver and in the dix pipe maneuver, the head trajectory is identical. So the sideline maneuver and dix pipe maneuvers are clinically equivalent. So if you, from here on, uh, whatever we say about dix pipe applies to the sideline maneuver. So it's really a preference of which one you want to do. I personally prefer the dix pipe. So in a normal individual, when you do a dixal pipe maneuver, you get a slight excitation of the posterior canal, a slight inhibition of the anterior canal, and the patient usually has uh, one or two beats of nystagmus, and that's it. On the other hand, this uh, graph here shows you what happens when the patient with the BPPV, with the canalitis of the posterior canal, this dixal pipe is performed on this patient. You can see that the canal, during this maneuver, undergoes about a 90 degree turn. So the particles that were at the lowest end of the, the canal, now they turn upside down and the particles now uh, end up in the uh, upper part of the canal. As these particles move down, it creates a suction behind it, pulls the cupula behind, and it causes strong excitation of the posterior canal and the excitation will result in upbeating nystagmus and torsion toward the undermost ear. So here's the typical eye movements that's resulting from a patient with uh, BPPV of the right uh, uh, posterior canal. When you lay the patient down from the sitting to supine position in the right ear, you see that the patient had upbeating nystagmus and torsion toward the right side. Uh, but the nystagmus is transient and it goes away. So there's a usually a delay onset. That's because it takes time for gravity to pull the particles through the canal. The nystagmus is transient because the, uh, it takes, once these particles get to the lowest end of the canal here, they settle down, they don't move anymore. So uh, that's why the nystagmus is transient. If you repeat the maneuver a few times, these particles scattered along the canal and they don't generate as much force so it's called the nystagmus is fatigable which means after repetition a few times you don't get much of a response now if you bring the patient back up you will get nystagmus reversed in the opposite direction you get uh, up uh, down beating nystagmus and torsion away from what you saw, you saw before that's because now the particles push against the cupula and cause inhibition of the posterior canal. In patients who have cupulatitis, the particles attached here, as you can see, to the cupula, the response is not much uh, different. The only major difference is that the delay on onset is much shorter. So when you lay the patient down, the response is very quickly showing up. Duration is much longer. Uh, so usually a minute is a good benchmark. If the patient is uh, having uh, nystagmus that continues uh, for over a minute, that's usually cupulatiasis. And the response does not fatigue as easily as it might fatigue in the canalitiasis. In practice, there's no easy way to distinguish between canalitiasis and cupulatiasis. So the best practice is that if you treat the patient, it's always best to treat for canalitiasis first because that's the highest uh, percentage success. If, for example, you're, um, uh, you treat the patient for canalitis and it's not successful, then you can treat for, uh, uh, for cupulatitis. Now, exactly what the difference is, I will discuss in the next uh, webinar, but primarily what we're discussing about is vibration. So here's the uh, eye movement as a result of uh, 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 cupulatitis. 
this video is fairly long. This is during the left dixal pike. You notice that the nystagmus is not fatiguing and you see the torsion. This goes on for over a minute. Uh, again, just because of time, I won't show this whole thing, but this is much longer. And as you notice, there was not much of a delay at all. And if you repeat this maneuver, it won't go away as much as uh, it does in uh, camelotysis. So on rare cases, the particles might end up in the anterior canal. So when you lay the patient down, <clears throat> instead of the upbeat nystagmus and torsion toward the undermost ear, you will see this. This is the video of the patient. You see downbeat nystagmus. Torsion is hard to see in this, but the, as you can see in this patient, the torsion is toward the left. This is the right dix pike. It's toward the left ear. So this patient has uh, anterior canal canalopiasis. This is extremely rare. And interestingly, this also causes excitation of the anterior canal because the, the particles end up in a place where they normally do not end up in the, in the posterior canal. It's on the opposite side of the cupula. And that's why it causes excitation. Uh, the orientation of the anterior canal makes it much more likely that the patient will suffer from BPPV of the anterior canal compared to the posterior canal. But other characteristics are the same as far as the delay onset and uh, uh, transient nystagmus and so forth. Bringing the patient back again reverses the nystagmus but actually may treat the patient. It might actually send the particles out of the canal. This might be another reason why canalithiasis of the anterior canal is so rare. All right, now if this, uh, uh, the patient who has history or com uh, compatible with BPPV, if they don't show uh, positive dixalpike maneuver, then the next thing to do would be a roll or log roll maneuver. You lift the patient's head at 30 degrees with the horizontal and you turn the head to the right or to the left. In this case, it's only half of the log roll maneuver. It's only showing the head turned to the left. But to complete this, you, after the, this maneuver is complete, you bring the patient's head back to the center and you repeat the maneuver again, this time to the right. Again, in this video, we're not showing the, <clears throat> the right side. We're only showing to the left movement. During the log roll maneuver, you will get responses both to the right and left regardless of which ear is involved. And depending on the strength of the response, you have to decide which side is the side of the BPPV. If the patient has geotropic nystagmus, which means nystagmus is beating right in the head right and beating left in the head left, this indicates that the patient has canalotiasis. In that case, the involved side is the strong uh, nystagmus side. If the patient exhibits ageotropic nystagmus, which means right beating nystagmus to the, um, in, in the head left and left beating nystagmus in the head right, that indicates it's a cupulatiasis and its stronger side is the intact side. Weaker side is the involved side. So here are the two videos. You can see that this patient, when the head is turned to the right, has very strong right beating nystagmus. And you can see that it's horizontal. It's transient. It goes away. You can see it's already getting weak. And then it stops. When you look at the head turned to the left, the patient has now left beating nystagmus, but it's not as strong. So because the nystagmus is geotropic, it's canalitisis, and more than likely this is the uh, uh, origin of it is the right ear. Now, it's very hard to decide which side is the stronger side. So there's a maneuver that you can perform to identify side of lesion. It is the, uh, in some versions, it's called bow and lean uh, type or, uh, of maneuver or head pitch. This is a better uh, method, but it works on the same principle. So you have the patient sitting down with their head tilted down, as you see in uh, figure A. Then you lay the patient down with the head straight, not turned right or left, 
with the head straight to the head lifted 30 degrees as you see in B. Record what, which direction the nystagmus is beating. This table helps you identify side of lesion. If you had geotropic nystagmus in the roll maneuver, then the nystagmus will beat away from the involved side during that sitting supine maneuver. If you had ageotropic nystagmus, then the nystagmus will beat toward the involved side in the uh, uh, sit, sit to supine maneuver. Okay, I will stop now and I will uh, give the uh, podium to my colleague Wendy to describe some of the uh, system's uh, uh, capabilities that you can use. Okay, so we're talking about the ICS impulse. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is the positional module, which we'll be releasing in May this year, 2015. So the ICS impulse can assist you in assessing the BPBV. If you notice here, if you're familiar with the ICS impulse, it's a very lightweight goggle, only 60 grams, which makes it great for doing these head position maneuvers. And it stays snug to the face, so as you're moving that head back or to the side, the goggles do stay in place. We're also releasing in May the vision denied solution so that you can perform the test with vision or vision denied um, as well. And then the other things, the other features, and we're going to talk a little bit more in detail, is that you've got real-time slow phase velocity. You can hook up an external monitor, so you can have a big monitor across from you. Um, you could have it on one side of your room, then have your laptop on the other side of the room so that you can always see the patient's response no matter which direction you're facing as you do these maneuvers and we're going to talk about head position feedback, and then what's great is the synchronized playback of the eye trace, the SPV graph, the eye video, the head position feedback, or if you're not using head position feedback, you can use the room video, which is a webcam. So talking about real-time slow phase velocity, um, and the other thing I'd like to mention is that the slow phase velocity algorithm um, Cameron Barine worked on this for five years, and we've actually implemented his new algorithm in there. It's extremely robust. It's really good also at picking up uh, low-level nystagmus, which is fantastic when you're dealing um, with BPBV um, and other disorders. So when you're actually doing the test during collection, if you see this on the external monitor over here, you see the eye and then you see the number there, number three, that's the real-time SPV. So you're going to have an idea of how robust that nystagmus is. So obviously, you, for Dix Hallpike, you bring the person back. Well, you don't want to bring them back up until that nystagmus has subsided, and it's very easy for you not only to see the eye, but also to see that slow phase velocity as well. And then, like I said, the external monitor is great. The one thing you don't see on the picture here is it also presents the elapsed time, so you know how long that you've um, left the person down um, when doing the maneuver. So you have the eye, the slow phase velocity, and the elapsed time. The head position feedback is a fantastic feature. There's actually a sensor in the goggle, so we know where that patient's head is in space. And it helps guide the physician or clinician to position the patient properly for different maneuvers, whether it be Dix Hall Pike, side lying, roll, and then also the treatment step, which we will talk about next month. Um, but what you see here when you're doing collection, this is the, um, uh, over on the left, you see a white pupil and a black background, and then over on the right, you see the head. And I'm going to start a video right now, and what I want you to also notice is the top trace is your horizontal trace. When we move that head 45 degrees, you'll see nystagmus. Right below the legend on the right side, you also see the, the real-time SPV number there as well. So let's start this video. This is actually an example of roll here. Here we go. So we move the head, and we're moving the head. The top bar is 55 degrees. The bottom bar is 90 degrees. You see that little bit of nystagmus that happened at the beginning of the trace? It's also showing you the canals near the head. Um, it shows you which canals you are uh, testing. So it's showing you the two lateral canals. Let's play that one more time so you can see it again. So again, it starts to move. We're going to move the head. You're going to see the nystagmus and the SPV number change. Um, that's because we moved the head that you see that little bit of nystagmus. Now, this is a normal response because after that, we don't have any nystagmus in the horizontal trace. But that shows you that you're positioning the head properly, that you're turning the head properly, 
um, within that 50 to 90 degree range. In Dix Hall Pike, we do 45 degrees, and then you bring the head back. Let me, I'm going to go back up one slide just to show you this. So step one would be the 45 degree turn on Dix Hall Pike. Step two would be dropping that head back um, so that the patient is supine and the head is dipped down a little bit um, below the table. The really nice thing about the playback is, like I said, the playback will play back the head, it'll play back the traces, it'll play back, um, you'll have an SPV graph, and everything is synchronized together. You can play it back as one whole session, or you can play it back wherever you want to start, um, so that you can always see how that data was collected and what the response was. So in summary, a uh, proper diagnosis of BPVV and its type can be achieved by selecting the appropriate maneuver, moving the head in the plane of the affected canal, monitoring eye movements throughout the maneuver, and then ICS Impulse allows for precise positioning of the head and recording of the eye movements during different maneuvers for diagnosis of BPVV. So I believe now we are going to um, take some questions. So let me see what we have here regarding questions. Um, so Dr. Barine, one of the first questions is, um, don't you think that some of the cases can be associated with neck problems, osteochondritis, uh, for example? Uh, the type of nystagmus we see as a result of <clears throat> maneuvers like uh, dix um and um, uh, roll maneuver are quite specific to the uh, excitation of the posterior canal or uh, anterior canal or the lateral canal. So, no, most of these conditions, if they are the type of nystagmus that we have talked about, are um, they're, they're BPPVs. Uh, they're not neck problems. But I think the question is related to one of the earlier slides, like the 40% case. Could it be that some of these are neck problems? Yes, they are. That's quite possible, especially the ones who do not come to the dizziness clinic because we don't have any evidence of uh, positive uh, dix pike or roll maneuver. Yes, then, then the, the question is quite uh, valid that some of those cases, especially if these were done by phone or questionnaire type of things, yes, they might be neck, neck issues. But if you do see this specific type of nystagmus that we have here, that's not, that cannot be from the neck issue. Okay, next question, and I think we'll probably talk about this in detail um, next month when we talk about treatment. But the question is, what is the relationship of reoccurrence of BPPV to effica uh, efficacy of treatment? Um, that has not been established. Uh, generally, once the patient's symptoms are relieved, and by the way, successful treatment in my, from my point of view is not just the relief of symptoms, but you have to have a negative dix hall pike. It's very important that you bring the patient back uh, within a reasonable amount of time, maybe a week or so after the treatment, and establish that the patient has negative hall pike or negative roll maneuver. Otherwise, sometimes the patients won't they just want to please you and say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm doing better. But if you don't have a, a negative dix pike, you cannot say that the treatment has been successful. Generally, if the treatment has been successful and you have negative uh, hull pike, then the recurrence rate is really not related to the, to the success of the maneuver. Generally, the same 30% that I mentioned, they will come back. Now, efficacy of the treatment, uh, I think it's more or less a binary issue. It's not that you will uh, leave the patient half treated. Either those particles are going to completely move out of the canal and the patient will be asymptomatic and negative uh, provocative maneuvers, or if the particles are left, then you're going to see that. So I think that's why it's important to establish efficacy by the dix hall pike and the ro uh, roll maneuver, not just by the patient's symptoms. Okay, next question. And Anders, please let me know when uh, we have no more time. But um, Dr. Barine, do you believe in light cupula yeah. and, 
in heavy cupula dysfunctions, cupula endolift density disorders with continuous geo and ageotropic nystagmus in pitch and or lateral plane. How do you treat these patients? Um, it says FPP, FPP question mark. Um, just wait four days or is there a relation to migraines even in heavy cupula? That's a very good question. Uh, we know that when the particles end up either attaching themselves to the cupula or to the, um, uh, or the, the uh, float in the canals, they're obviously, they can be treated by separating them from the uh, cupula or by just making them travel through the particles. But if for conditions uh, that Theoretically, uh, it's possible that the cupula or endolymph might get heavier or lighter than the surrounding um, endolymph. For example, some of the conditions that we know will cause this, uh, alcohol or any substance that's uh, absorbed into the endolymph and it has a different specific density than endolymph, at least temporarily will make the, uh, the cupula either heavier or lighter than the surrounding endolymph endolymph and will cause a very similar type of nystagmus to cupulatiasis. We cannot distinguish heavy or uh, light endolymph from cupulatiasis on the basis of the responses. The responses are the same. The only way we can distinguish them is that the treatment for BPPV will be continue, uh, repeatedly unsuccessful in patients with heavy or uh, light cupula. Uh, and again, some of these um, uh, uh, metabolic disorders that we know very little about uh, could, could cause this kind of heavy or endolymph, uh, uh, heavy or light uh, cupula. Um, we have no way of, at least uh, 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 other than theoretical, we don't have a way of experimentally uh, talking about this. And it's possible that it could be related to, uh, to migraines, but I don't know that for sure. It's just that we don't have a, a good way of assessing this. Now, the best way, as I said, if the treatment after two or three uh, repetitions are unsuccessful, then you have to look for other causes of uh, that's uh, making this condition. Uh, and uh, as far as the treatment options, again, we'll discuss this in our next webinar. There are no treatments that I know of for metabolic disorders of this kind or heavy or endolymph cupula. If the patient's obviously has been drinking alcohol or something, or you can have them stop drinking, but otherwise uh, I don't know of any uh, effective way of treating this. I think Andres wants to jump in here, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, I, I will we wait. Have, we have time for one final question and then uh, we'll end today's session. So. Uh, okay. So I think we, there's one more here, um, and obviously we will, res the ones that we don't get around to, we will respond to you in email. Um, I also want to point out um, icsimpulse.com, when we launch um, this month the positional module, you will be able to find information on icsimpulse.com. Headimpulse.com talks about VHIT um, and also talks about where people are presenting on uh, VHIT in courses globally. And then odometrics.com, you can also go to the balance products and find out information about uh, products that we offer for vestibular testing. So the last question would be, Dr. Barine, where would I find further information about what m might be done to rule out a CNS cause? Um, generally, I think um, most of the papers or chapters that you read about BPPV what they recommend is that if you treat the patients once, twice, or at most three times, and with consideration that you treat for canalatiasis, if it's not successful, you treat for cupulatiasis, make sure that you rule out uh, uh, lateral canal BPPV once you do that. So after three treatments, if the patient is not uh, responding to these uh, treatments, then you assume that something else is uh, causing the BPPV and you do a full workup, which includes MRIs, full vestibular testing. This is unlike the recommendation of American Academy of Laryngology. This patient falls into a category 
of that there are other signs and symptoms that are not compatible with the BPPV. So in that case, yes, you do full workup on these patients. You do a, a complete vestibular assessment. You do an MRI and uh, uh, try to rule out CNS abnormalities. However, having said that, <clears throat> if you have that question, previous question, that uh, metabolic disorders that might, again, theoretically, might cause heavy or uh, uh, light cupula, they're quite unlikely that anything will show up in the, in the MRI for these patients. So there are going to be cases of BPPV or what seems like BPPV that we will have no answer. Uh, a related question to that is that sometimes you, you have patients who have symptoms that are consistent with BPPV, but you don't see any positive Dix-Hall-Pike or positive role maneuver. It's been shown that the repositioning maneuvers can be successful in these patients. Uh, usually this is like the, might be the, the, again, related to one of the questions of incomplete treatment. If the particles that are left in the canal are, there are so few of them that they're not generating excessive response, but the patient feels that, then in these cases, doing a repositioning maneuver might actually be successful. So it's been shown that this is effective in patients who have subjective vertigo but no objective uh, um, uh, nystagmus due to the Xalpine. I just want to say I see some familiar names on the list of the participants. Thank you for all coming, and uh, I will uh, turn this back to uh, Wendy and Andres here. Well, uh, thanks for today, everybody, for listening in. Uh, we hope you found today's session useful and uh, that you will 